All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to another day of class, day three of CS 219. So today we're gonna pick up where we uh, left last time, which was we were just about to talk about the different uh, different processors over the years, and uh, from there that's we're gonna finish talking about chapter one and start talking a little bit about, about chapter two. By the way, don't forget that tomorrow you have your discussion session with the TA that will be at the same time as class time and he will go over some of the back of the book or not back, back at end of the chapter problems so that you can kind of see a little bit about the kind of uh, math-ish sort of things that you might need to know for the test or in general some kind of you know practice and preparation for the midterm and final um, in addition to that I want you guys to read by tomorrow up to I, I I forget what I put on canvas let me see I think I put 2.5 or 2.3 on canvas I do want you to read up to that because I do want the TA to go over Amdahl's law and uh, Little's, Little's law yeah so I have until read from read all the way to 2.5 uh, tomorrow while we will talk about the material during class on Monday I do want you to uh, practice with him a couple of math examples with Amdahl's law just it's very simple math but it but it might be good practice that way you, uh, I can just talk about the a little bit the theory behind it but then we can just uh, move away from practicing some math we'll be on WebEx too um, that's the plan I think however if uh, if if the TA should be able to join and we tested it yesterday actually where he joined the uh, the WebEx meeting before I did and uh, it worked fine so as long as that's the case and it will be through WebEx if, if he has technical issues then he will host it via Discord so uh, and I think a mixture of Discord and potentially maybe even Twitch so just if 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 you don't see him show up by 1120 then uh, then you know check canvas and check Discord but uh, he'll he should have no problems with it so it, it should be the same link and everything. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be around just to make sure that nothing goes bad. But yes, that must be, that is most likely the case going to be that it'll be through WebEx unless there is like a WebEx technical problem. And by the way, if we ever have that in this class, you can always just, we can have, we have a lot of backups. So you just keep up, you know, make sure you're all on Discord and update yourselves on what's happening to there. But yes. So, um, yeah, that's gonna to be tomorrow. Okay, from sync last time, and I, 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 do, I did tell him as well to copy and paste the, uh, the chat log so that I can add it onto my script, which I will write this weekend. I just, it, it will take like twenty minutes, but I just been busy. But uh, yeah, I'll do a little Python script that basically takes everybody's names and then scores participation. So don't change your name though, otherwise, it will. Uh, I don't. I, it it'll score you under two different names, and if you don't have your real name on Canvas, like I think one person does, that's okay. You'll just need to tell me the name later on, and I'll have to manually. I guess a lot of thing on the script to replace, find and replace somebody's name with a with the real name, like a nickname with a real name or something. So yeah, okay. So um, let me go ahead and switch over. Well, first let me switch to this, so you can have the screenshot for the video. So, cool. All right, and then let's just switch to the PowerPoint. Okay, so before I, uh, you know, the last thing I said, we were just gonna talk about the, uh, the, the evolution of the Intel, basically, microprocessors, right? But before that, I kind of wanted to go back to this slide and talk a little bit about this whole transition from like individual transistors to a silicon, basically chip you know and that was the, the big breakthrough there was actually because of integrated circuits and that's really what the chip the Intel chip is it's an integrated circuit that has not just transistors but also has memory cells right because we saw in the little diagrams that they have the little cat the L1 caches inside of it and there's also the uh, the uh, the like the different registers like instruction register and there's also like the memory buffer registers and all these registers so there's little memory cells in there 
So that's kind of your data storage. Then you got your processing done by the, by the uh, transistors, which are the logic gates. And then everything in there is connected as well. So there's some sort of data movement going on, right? And a control unit that kind of gets everything going together. Now that you would have in a normal, uh, in a, in a, well, not normal, but like in an old school computer where everything was separate, like transistors were their own thing and whatnot. But the, by being integrated, everything there is basically put in the semiconductor, which in this case is silicon. And so by putting everything in there, you know, you save a lot of space and technically you save a lot of silicon because everything is really nice and tight, but it's the same amount of silicon every time, especially as, as, as you make things smaller and you can fit more transistors, you know, you're fitting more information there, but you're still using the same amount of silicon per se, because it's still a chip. And so it's not, inherently more expensive as as uh, as in like the product of course their r d is expensive i mean but you know i actually do wonder how much an intel chip is physically worth in terms of raw material and i would i would get i would bet that it's a very very low amount because i think probably like 90 percent of the cost there is coming from uh from the research it's kind of like medicine you know a lot of medicine is very cheap to manufacture but it costs a lot because of the R and D behind it, right? So it's the same thing. I the same idea here. Um, so yeah, that, basically, that, um, an integrated circuit is the transition from going from individual parts in a little breadboard or a PCB uh, into basically just a little silicon wafer. Um, and of course, that's what this looks like, right? And whereas you know, a PCB is the, the green thing here. Imagine that in this picture, the one on the right, there was little transistors in there and, and you know, the little lines are, are kind of done here, but imagine there's like wires and things like that. And, you know, that that's more, it's slower. And by putting things together, you can make them faster too. There's less time for, like travel, right? Less, less chance of things heating up too. So, yeah, move this chat over here so I can see it better, okay. So now back to this. So let's go ahead and look, take a look at the evolution of the microprocessor. So basically the evolution of your of your little CPUs, like your main chip. First we got the, uh, and in the book there's an entire 1.5. They kind of describe a, a couple of these. So I wanted to, um, when I was looking right before the class, you know, because there's a couple of sort of fun facts per se on each of these that's kind of, important to note out so the first one being the 8080 that will be the 72 model that you see here the second column well technically third but yes this one right here so that was like the world's first general purpose microprocessor you know in terms of the uh the bus width that that's very important because that defines pretty much like the the communication between the different parts and if the bus width is smaller than per se, say you have a RAM that can keep 16 bits or 32 bits as you typically have, or 64 bits actually, that would be more typical nowadays. If your bus width is size of eight, it means you gotta send things in, in pieces and that is slow. So typically your bus width is usually gonna be what kind of defines the, uh, the, the entire bit size of everything from registers to memory, to uh, pretty much that, I guess, I suppose, the, the whole addressing system in the computer. And so you will see usually this will match what the, the, the RAM number of bits is in general, or and the, like I said, the register. So anyways, so basically that's what it kind of says here on, on the book. It says it was an 8-bit machine with 8-bit data path to memory. And uh, the name of the computer was called the Altair. Now, we can probably Google a picture of it. Might as well show you since it's kind of like historically significant what that looked like. Uh, Altair 8080. So it it looks like a big box essentially, but still it's not that big to the point that you can't uh, that you can't carry it around. Or at least, you know, if you're strong. 
So there it is. That's kind of small, but let me see if I can. Uh... There's a little box. So basically, that's kind of what you would expect. So it looks like a, it looks like a CPU. I mean, here, oh, here, here's a kind of a top view picture of it. You can kind of see. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that like one of those big sticks is probably like the RAM, and then one of those is probably the CPU. I've never seen one in person. I mean, this is like in the past for me, before I was born. But um, yeah, you can see that it, it kind of looks like a modern computer. You know, it's got boards in there. Now, unlike a modern computer, you have these little big, potentially, I don't know, are they vacuum tubes? I don't know. Um, and then just I'm assuming it's a power supply, which does actually kind of look like a modern power supply. But um, yeah, and then you got little... Oh yeah, I don't think I don't I don't never see these anymore in computers. The little uh, the bands here, yeah, I don't, yeah. I think the last time I saw that was like in the early night in the early two thousands. So yeah, that's basically what it looked like. Okay, so there's a picture of a hand, so you can kind of get the scale of it. Maybe there's another one where there's like a person. Here's a combo, you know. Here's here's your rig where you got your monitor and everything. So, uh, yeah, it really just needs some RGB and it's good to go. I agree. Uh, I mean, you got the R part of RGB in there with the little lights coming on and off. Uh, let's see, I, wonder if I want one next to a person so you can kind of, yeah, okay. Here we go. There's a person next to it. Ah, that's, that looks old. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, you can get a feel for it. So, it's, so it's, it's about the same size as a, like a full tower, I suppose, per se um yeah yeah so okay that that's that's kind of good for scale so don't, don't don't think it was like a mainframe like old school computer from like movies no this is actually a personal size computer and you know there was what was the price actually because that's actually kind of a altair 8080 uh price let's see what, what they actually sold for oh it says right there actually introductory price 439 us dollars which the equivalent today would be about two thousand dollars essentially assembled so i guess if you wanted a, you know versus like putting it together then it would be three thousand dollars so i guess for nine hundred dollars you can get it assembled so uh that seems like a lot but at the same time it doesn't seem like a lot because there's computers today that you could very easily spend about two thousand so you can see that even back then the price of computers was about the same as what it was today once inflation is computed in yeah sure you're like oh back in the day we got the best computer cost six hundred dollars right but inflation and you know the value of money has gone down be because of just how the economy works uh it would be about the same as it is today you know about two thousand dollars now you're like well i can i can buy a computer for a thousand now yeah you're right and you know it has gone a little bit down but on average you know this was like high-end kind of even though the first one the first one is usually something that high, you know high end that comes out think about like the first like iphone that came out and the price of that and that kind of thing so yeah so the big point of that being that you can see how the technology was doubling every year but the price was about the same okay um i don't think it had necessarily a very uh, nice gui no i think it was just terminal base you know so yeah but hey that's all you needed back then so anyways from there that was um you can see the clock speed is in the kilohertz again we'll talk in detail about clock speed that, that's basically um to be able to to sort of order things and you know if you got multiple multiple instructions coming in if you just feed them all as a, like a, just throw it at the thing that that's called i believe asynchronous they teach you that in cpe but if you have a clock rate a clock speed then uh it's kind of basically going like on off on off on off and each of those is one instruction and if you get it ready to go then you feed it in if you don't then you don't feed it in and then you feed it like an idle instruction you know like zeros or something so this could process 108 kilohertz. Now kilo means, means a thousand. So this is technically over a hundred thousand instructions per second. You know, you tell that to somebody back in the day, and they're like, "Oh wow!" You know, 
a hundred thousand instructions per second that's a lot more than i can do you know and so it was and so even back then people were like wow computers are amazing and the future is now flying cars in five years confirmed kind of thing so um yeah and how did you, this get achieved this got achieved with a mere at least compared to the today's numbers 3,500 transistors and those were all well i was maybe not all but i would say like 99.9 .9 of them were probably in the silicon wafer and they were all integrated together in this little thing probably about this big okay um the the feature size is going to be basically you can think about the size of the transistors and they were about eight picometers in size i think that's the pico the little the the little underscore you like that. Let me let me let me uh, let me triple check that. Picometer symbol. Uh, it just says PM. What is that then? Is that is that a micrometer maybe? Chat, you guys check it out. Go, go look again at that at that one wiki link that I keep forgetting. Uh, is that one? It's called like magnitude, Ma observe magnitudes. I think. Is that is that what we? Forget? I don't think it's nanometer. It would not make sense for it to be nanometer. That would be too small. Okay, the observed orders of magnitude is an insane amount of size article. Time. That's what it is. Orders of magnitude. In, wait, time. You want it's micro okay cool so micro all right so it was eight eight micrometers okay so essentially that's how big the transistors were okay and now we're at like the uh, at the nanometers okay so this was micro micro to nano okay so I, okay so i guess in that case it goes uh milli for you know thousands and then for the next three zeros it's micro and then it goes nano, I think. Okay, so uh, yeah. So basically, in in nanometers, since that's what we're used to nowadays, this would be, I think, eight thousand nanometers. Okay, I believe that would be the case. And thank you again for posting that link. Why can't I? Uh, here we go. So you can see it. So here we got milli, micro, and nano. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So and here we go. There is a the symbol. So yeah. So think of this as eight thousand nanometers okay that will give you a better sense of scale once we uh once we go further down the chart okay and then addressable memory we ask how much ram you essentially had and not just actually no that's the maximum amount of ram that you could have so there what is that limited on that that is basically limited on the size of registers and so um if you are trying to create a pointer you know you need to you need to keep the the pointer in one uh, in one register, right? Like if, if we go back to looking at like the opcode thing, opcode and address here, you know, the opcode, you know, you need to keep that of course as well. But you the address where you're basically accessing the data from, this in this case is twelve bits, right? This number of bits has to be uh, is is how much how much memory you can have. So so how much memory could you keep in twelve bits? Okay, well, convert each, remember this is binary, so basically 2 to the 12, and what is 2 to the 12? Let's see, 2 to the 12 is going to be 4096, okay? And so that means that I can count from 1 or from, okay, see, yes, people, I can count from 0 to 4095, okay? And so going back to this, when, when this is, it can be 16 kilobytes, um, of, of, of addressing per se what that is saying is 16,000 addresses so if 12 can go up to 4,000 that means that the the addresses in this system could uh, basically have at least two more bits for addressing so two to the two to the 14th power okay that would get you to the 16 16,384 which is probably what this number actually is in reality and that is how you're limited because probably the way that the uh, the system worked was you had that much for the address and then you needed more for the opcode, okay? 
And so you can have less memory than this. You just don't use it. But uh, that is the limitation of how much you can have. Because what happens if you, if you have more RAM than that? Well, you only have probably about 14 bits for addressing. And if you have more, then you have no way to access those because you can't fit them in the address. Like if you have a pointer pointing to an address in address 20,000, but you only can fit from 0 to 16,000, then you can't fit the, the, the enough bit, bits to actually dereference that address. Does, does that make sense? You know, think about your, you know, back from, a C, you know, CS-135 and actually CS-202 when they teach you about pointers. So, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the, where, where the limit from the addressable memory comes from. Because if the number is too big and you can't store it in the address part of the uh, instruction, then you can't access it. And I, that's not something that affected us now, but what definitely did affect us, and I think, I hope, I think, you were all alive when we made the change was from 32-bit to 64-bit addressing. So, anyways, moving on from the 8080, the uh, the next sort of breakthrough was going from eight bit eight bits to sixteen bits, and that was with the eighteen eighty six and nineteen seventy eight. As you can see, the bus width went up from eight to sixteen. That was a, a big upgrade because that allowed us to have more memory, at least the up to up the limit of how much memory we could have. Again, <clears throat> these are maintaining for the most part the same architecture, but the organization is different, and. When you do switch from technically from eight to 16 bit, that's a little bit of an architecture change, but uh, other than that, things were about the same. <clears throat> I don't know, you can hear my, my dog like snoring. Let me take some water. So as you can see, the clock speed is kind of consistently increasing as the years go by. And now here we had the first kind of variable clock speed. Okay, so basically, you know, tiered probably based on price. <clears throat> and the transistors are going, are pretty much doubling each year. Even though you don't see it here, you can kind of do the math that if we start out with about, you know, 3,500, technically in 73, you know, that, that kind of doubles to about <clears throat> 7,000. And yes, you see here, this is 6,000, but it's about an average of that because this is around the time that we switch from 12 years, or sorry, the 12 months to 18 months for the doubling of the size. But uh, if you do the math, it kind of goes there. It's not exact, but it's about an average. As you can see, this kind of between this, these two years is about the same here. But then we'll see the big jump in the, in the following here. You can see that the size of the uh, of basically the transistors per se is going down. You know, now we are at three thousand nanometers, and uh, yeah. So from there, I suppose the uh, the big thing about the eighty eighty six was that uh, they added in the instruction cache that we've been talking about, which is kind of like your queue that prefetches the instructions from main memory and puts them ready to go so that you can feed them in faster. So that was the big thing then. Um, also the 8088, which is the one over here, that was apparently uh, IBM's first personal computer. So that's when IBM kind of jumped into the market and also secure the success of Intel because that kind of uh, meant that everybody wanted to do Intel then. You know, Intel was the craze back then. And that was also, this is very, very significant here because that is the beginning of the x86 architecture. Even though this one is still eight bits versus this back when they were at 16, this was like the beginning of the architecture that we still use up to today. I mean, plus minor modifications, but this is kind of like the OG architecture. That is, you're, more than likely, your computer is running right now if you're looking at this in a home computer and not in a in the ARM-based chip or uh, a phone, essentially. So yeah, that was a big one. Okay, so from there, uh, we move on into the 80s, essentially. And uh, what is significant on this one, the 80286 here, that moved to 16-bit. Uh, so that's significant because that's kind of the evolution of the uh, of the of the IB, of the IBM side of things. So that's from IBM. You know, when they came out with the x86, they they were at eight bits. So I guess in this point they were kind of behind the Altair people and and their computers, but uh, then they caught up and they released a 16-bit you know machine. 
and that could also take advantage of memory. But that could actually go up to uh, 16 megabit of memory, which you can see is, is better than the Altair. So that there's that. Also, there's you can see that there's an introduction of virtual memory. So virtual memory. Uh, is there, before I try to tell you what it is, let me see if there's something here about it that when they say that they introduced that. Um, nope, they don't talk about it. So here's the thing about virtual memory. Uh, memory starts getting so big that it's not such a good idea to have direct addressing in your memory system. So like, you know, I when I when I do when I teach 135 and 202 and 302. I, I sometimes tell people that I lie about this and sometimes I don't, but the truth is that when we tell you that a pointer is getting the address in memory, it's kind of a lie because you're not really getting the address in memory. What you're getting is a virtual address. So what ends up happening is internally, the addressing of your RAM is only maintained by the operating system. And then the addressing that you get in your program, those addresses that you get when you're dereferencing a pointer in C++, those are not the real addresses. Those are what are known as virtual addresses. And they're, they're kind of given to you by the OS for a couple of reasons. One of them being because memory is so big that trying to maintain addresses that big is just a pain. And instead, if, if the... Uh, if the addressing system is given to you within a specific section, you can make your pointer addressing smaller because you know you're not going to use that much memory. That is a limitation, though, then you can't use all the memory. Furthermore, it also prevents you from doing bad, dumb things like trying to access other, uh, other, other programs as memory because by using the virtual addressing, it will know if it's out of the range that, of what you're sort of designated to have. And somewhere in the book, I, I, I do remember that they had a mentioned about this, in, 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 at least in chapter one, that is, co it's called the uh, memory control. Actually, I think, I think they mentioned it when they talk about what, embedded systems or about ARM. Let me skip ahead really fast to see if I can find the name of that. Uh, MP, I think it's MPU, yeah, memory protection unit. So that's basically a hardware module that prohibits one program in memory from accidentally accessing memory assigned to another active program. So this kind of stuff can be achieved with virtual memory. Also, although technically it can be achieved even without it, it's a lot easier to achieve with. And so that makes it so that you don't accidentally buffer overflow in your program or sorry, or go or out of bounds, sorry. If you go out of bounds in an array and you try to, and you hit another program's data, it prevents you from not just accessing the data, but modifying it and, and breaking their program as long as, as, as well as your program, right? Are they words around this? Of course there are. Those are your injectors when you're injecting like cheats in the game or a DLL or things like that. So there are ways around this. Um, but but again, that's that's getting hacking-ish basically. Not, not by accident you would do that. And really this is mostly protecting from accidents, not from malicious intent. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of like the whole idea with virtual address memory. And that's going to be the other big thing of the class. So the, like the, we got pipelining as one thing, and then we got cache, and then virtual memory and addressing. But again, the addressing part, I think part of that is mostly covered in 370. I, I just seem to recall that from memory. But we'll see if we hit it in the book, we will talk about it, about the different systems for converting a virtual address to an actual address. And, and that, you know, there's a lot of different sort of techniques for doing it. Um, and uh, you learn them. And I'm pretty sure you learn them in 370, but hey, if they're here, we'll talk about them. They're, 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 some of them are gonna be quite complicated. And then uh, I just seem to recall like getting tested on them and having to remember how to do them and having to make sure I keep them straight because they all do different techniques. So uh, yeah. So anyways, virtual memory was introduced essentially here, okay? Um, from there, what sort of the next big breakthrough was in? The 80386. So that would be kind of in the, in the, is that probably the 90s? No, 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 no. That's already Pentium. I guess they don't show it here, but uh, 80386. Yeah, oh, this one probably, probably the 386 here that's just spelled out like that. Yeah, because this is 32 bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was when they switched over to 32 bits, and that was like the major overhaul. Because right now, they were just adding more crap to the same system. And when they did the switch to 32 bits, they actually took the time to maybe like clean up some stuff 
you know, it's like, hey, let me clean up my code kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it really, um, it really like changed things to the point that it even says here that uh, the it rival in complexity and power to like mainframes that were introduced a few years earlier. So that amount of power was about the same level that a supercomputer back in like the 70s had. And you can see that the transistors are now going over to the quarter million mark, basically. So it's getting pretty big. Uh, also, one big thing that was introduced here that a lot of people take for granted, was, and, and this is we're talking in the year already 85, was multitasking. Multitasking was introduced. So before then, you could only run one program at a time. And in, in this computer, basically, you introduce the idea of multitasking and being able to run more than one program at a time. And that also made the computer a lot harder when it comes to pipelining, which I'll talk to in a soon here, in a moment here. So that was a big thing, okay? Um, the next from there, let's see if there's anything else. Let's be kind of speed up here. Um, I think this one, they say they added in some, some math code processing. That's kind of when they started to fiddle with the idea of having a GPU, I think, or at least a separate processor for computing math than then doing it all in the cpu so sort of this idea of delegating some of the math computation to outside the cpu and having an idea the sort of the the origins of their gpu idea okay and from there now we hit the 90s so the 90s we get into the pentium line this is what i remember from when i was a kid uh, i think we had a pentium 3 or a pentium 2 but we also had a pentium at some point as well yeah, I think our, my first computer was a Pentium. And uh, you can see that we're at the millions of, in transistors. And then the feature size, you know, finally we are getting outside of the layer of, of micrometers and into nanometers. Now we're at 800 nanometers. So that's more respectable to today's standard, I suppose. The clock speeds are still in the, in the megahertz, but still that's million of, of computations or cycles per second, potentially million computations per second. 60 million to 166 million. So that's still pretty big. Uh, it also introduced superscalar techniques, which we might get to talk about. Um, but also, it started to to, uh, to flirt with the idea of parallel computing and doing uh, instructions executed in parallel. So that was the main sort of selling point of the Pentium. Um, branch prediction, or at least well done branch prediction or aggressive branch prediction so really trying to push branch, pre branch prediction branch prediction is the thing we we're talking about when like you know you got to put in your instruction cache the next instructions to run right and if you got a if statement which one do you put there which you got you don't, you don't have enough space to put everything in there so you got to pick one or the other or if there's like 20 maybe you pick the top two right so that sort of really aggressive branch prediction to really try to get this right instead of just like hey we'll just put some very easy algorithm that kind of works most of the time but then it fails a lot of the time too then this was the first time they took that really seriously and uh that was with the pentium pro that they did that really aggressive branch prediction um as you can see here your addressable memory is pretty big at this point, you know, although in reality with the Pentium, you could not go this big in memory. Um, you can see here that between here and here, you know, in 89, that's when we started throwing in the idea of cache. Okay. That's also kind of a thing that I, I didn't quite mention. So now with the Pentium, L, Pentium Pro, you can see that L2 cache came up. With Pentium, they only had the L1 cache, and that was it. Here, we started introducing the idea of L2 cache. So the point, because we got fast enough that RAM was getting a little bit too slow for our taste. And so that's when we started throwing in uh, cache in there. Pentium 2 um, incorporated MMX technology, which is basically for processing uh, video, audio, and graphics efficiently. So that was kind of their thing. Pentium 3 kind of improved on floating point instructions. So GPU kind of stuff um, by adding 70 new instructions related to that kind of thing. So uh, basically they improved on the digital and video processing. This is when uh, games were also starting to get very popular and that was like a business for them to have that kind of stuff in there, but also like using computer to do editing and those sort of things. Then uh, Pentium 4 kind of improved floating point again on multimedia. This is in 2000. 
that uh, this is pretty recent now, at least for me, it's like when I was like fully aware and conscious and I was using a computer common. Uh, finally, at this is the time when we also hit the gigahertz in the clock cycle. And it was like, wow, I can do a billion instructions, you know, a billion cycles at the same time. When programs are in secondary storage, they all have virtual addresses until they're loaded into RAM. They, they will have virtual addresses even if they're loaded into RAM as well. But uh, what you can do is you can definitely use a virtual address to access stuff in a hard drive as well, even if it's not in RAM. Uh, you, basically, the program has an address which can refer to the RAM, to the hard drive, or just about anything else. And so uh, basically, you can, uh, you know, the OS will figure out where is this even stored? Is this in main memory? Is it still in the hard drive or what? That's why you can see the virtual address going very, very big because it can access stuff in a hard drive. So which is kind of the idea of the swap file, if you know what that is, which is like being able to use a hard drive as extra memory, but it's very bad because it's very slow. Why the Pentium 4 loses caches over the Pentium 3? Uh, no. Oh, oh, why it went down? Uh, well, probably because if I was to guess is that even though, you know, we're, we're sort of mentally adapted that bigger is better, but maybe what happened here is that the 256 kilobit L2 cache was probably a faster version of the older 512 kilobit cache. And because it was more expensive, they said, hey, we can go down without losing uh, actual uh, actual efficiency. So there's a lot of times when you can see things go down like that, but it's not necessarily that they're getting slower. They're probably just using better memory that's more expensive. So they kind of had to do some pick some cuts because they still got to stick to the whole under two thousand dollar computing so that's my guess as to why uh, that computer back there used to be pentium 4 i think and then it went up I, and i switched to a core 2 duo so anyways from there um the core yeah yeah the core this is this is kind of a thing so this is when we okay so this is around the time that we were having problems with moore's law and we were like oh shoot you know how do we grow the transistors at this point and kind of, we're kind of, uh, we kind of started flirting with the idea of like, okay, let's just put two cores in the same chip. And that's one way to increase the transistors. If we can't figure out how to make the feature size smaller, you can see here that we're in the nanometers now, and, uh, you are still kind of getting it smaller in the nanometers, but we're not getting small enough per se. And so also we need, we, we kind of we're getting ambitious with like ways of getting more computing power faster. Cause I mean, we don't have to follow Moore's law. If we can go faster than Moore's law. That's even better for us. That's more computers sold in the same amount of time. And so the core line of Intel, that's when they introduced uh, uh, the, the, the parallel programming per se with the, the multi-core multi computer as we know it today, which is which has gone up until today's computing systems. So uh, the core, is the first x86 microprocessor with a dual core, uh, which is which is referring to the implementation of two cores on a single chip. And then the core two, which was a really the popular one, is uh, extending the architecture into 64 bits. So that's another thing that the bus width went up to 64 bit. Although technically RAM was still 32 bit at the time for the most part, the bus width was a 64. So you could carry two entire addresses of 32-bit RAM in there. And that was done because sort of in preparation to the idea of transitioning into 64-bit RAM, which happened around 2010, I think. That was when it really, I, I don't know which DDR back then, but that's when we switched over to, to that because the most amount of memory that we could really have in a computer was uh, four, four, four gigabytes. And then switching over to 64-bit enabled us to have much more memory than that. As you see, 64 gigabytes, which actually more than that, actually, with 64 bit, you can have, even, I think, even more than 64 gigabytes of memory. You might actually be able to have uh, somewhere in between these two numbers. So, yeah. From there, um, you can kind of see some of the modern ones. So now we're at the billionth number of transistors. And this is this stops at 14 nanometers but if you there's I, I, there, wikipedia has a series of articles on the different uh thickness of uh intel chips Let's see if i can find it yeah so 14 nanometer process so if you go down to the bottom here you can see the the, the line of things so let me let me zoom in on this 
So you can read on them, and they have a name for each of them. So like Haskell, Broswell, uh, Ice Lake, uh, Rocket Lake. Which of the ones? Sky Lake is the one that I know. That's like the name that I just remember. But uh, yeah, so you you can see the different sizes. So this kind of stops at Sky Lake, I believe, because I was four. The, the last thing here was a fourteen nanometer chip. Yeah. Uh, but from there, you know, we have the ten nanometer chips, which uh, Coffee Lake. Initially expected 2015, 2018, on October it, it was continuing it, so I guess it kind of skipped the architecture, I suppose. And then what is like, a, what is our current, like, the 10 generation? I believe that, what is that going to be? The i10, i9, 10, 9, 0, 0, okay. Amazon. I think that already came out. I'm not 100% sure. It was just about to come out. I actually want to buy it once it is properly for sale because I need to upgrade. But uh, what I want to find out is what the name of, what is the name of, 14 nanometers. So they're still using the 14 nanometers. As you can see, we're, we're, we're kind of struggling our way in there. So it's still using Skylake. Yeah. So it's still using Skylake. Okay. So from there, we saw that the 10 nanometer thing is kind of having issues, but there's other ones. So I'm going to go ahead and guess maybe, what is this? Well, no, Tiger Lake. Let's try, let's look at Tiger Lake and see what that says. Or Alder Lake, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Upcoming. It is basically Intel's 12th generation architecture. So you can see that even though the 10th generation is just about to come out, they're still working on the 12th. And yes, I was going to say that, yes, you got the Intel. So what is the what is AMD's thing? Okay, so that is called, and that's the other the thing, it's called the multi-chip module. So if you go and look on page 20 in your book, they start talking about the multi-chip module, which is sort of an alternative to this. So the basic idea between developing a multi-chip module is to decrease the average space between the integrated circuit and the electronic system. So basically, they're packing more stuff into your chips. And so that's kind of what AMD is, is, has done. But, uh, you know, let's, let's pull it up here. It's called the Zen 3, I think, right? Or is it? Yeah, AMD Zen 3. So Zen 2 was 7 nanometers, and then, oh, I guess this is still 7. Allegedly, 5 nanometers and 4. However, you know, I'm an Intel guy, which is why I'm not too familiar with that. But I did read about that, and I did have it in my notes because I wanted to... Uh, to show a broader view of the force here. Yeah, AMD is Zen 2. So, yes, okay. And then we talked about all of that. And then we should do that. Okay, so then we, I think we can talk about embedded systems now. But anyways, so, we are still we're, we're still holding in there hanging in there for for moore's law um you can see the uh how many transistors that's actually in the uh how many transistors does um does the zen have actually that's a good question you guys google that and figure that out I, and then I'll, I'll google how many does the i the i9 10th generation has transistor count so the i9, and by the way, when you get to Intel's i number, I believe that is going to be the number of uh, cores, because I think like i5 has six, or, or, or i7 has, I, let's see, no, i3 has four, I think, i5 has six, i7 has eight, and I'm gonna guess i9 has 10 maybe? Um, they kind of go weird with the numbers here. But anyways, 
1.7 billion transistors. That's, so the i9 has eight cores. So then the i7 has six cores. And then the i5 has four cores. And maybe the i3 has two cores, maybe? I don't know. But... Uh, Here, let's see this stuff. So here we can we can analyze this better. So by the way, the K when you see Intel processors means that you can overclock it. Overclocking means increasing the cycle, uh, the clock cycle. By increasing the clock cycle, you generate a ton of heat, which can make your thing melt down if you don't have proper cooling. So we got ten cores, a number of threads. You can see that each core has two threads. You can put a little question mark here, and it tells you even what it is. A thread is or try to execute this software term for basic order sequence of instructions. So basically, you can feed in two completely chains, so this will have two pipelines of instructions within the same core. Bus speed, um, eh, that's not as important. What do we, we, we see bus with? But it's probably 64-bit. Uh, cache, so um, what is their best version of cache? A fast memory located on the processor. But we, we know a little bit more than that. We will, at least at the end of the class. But uh, you can see the clock cycle. Although this turbo thing, yeah, I would go with this one. Uh, this is uh, important. The uh, this number of powers that you need to, to, to electricity to run it, which has remained relatively consistent over the years, um, as long as you keep the same size. And that was one part of Moore's law, actually. Um, this is the RAM it uses. We will talk about what DDR stands for. I think it's actually in uh, chapter two. And then, um, let's see, if you, did you guys find out the number of transistors for the AMD? 9.89 billion transistors with the Zen 2 uh, for AMD. That's how you can go before hitting transfer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty big. So, however, you know, in 2000, uh, even the book says it, in 2017, we had seven. So, as you can see, we're really having an issue here with uh, Moore's Law right now, but... We will figure something out. We can just put more cores like Intel did with the i9. You know, Amazing breakthrough from i7 to i9. What did they do? They just added more cores. You know? Why not? So, yeah. It might be interesting. I'm, I should tell the TA to like, maybe that maybe maybe Sam is like an AMD person and he can talk more about AMD. That would actually be cool. I hope he is now. I'll ask him. If he is, then tomorrow he can talk and spiel AMD. I used to like AMD because I had when they when it was ATI, you know, before they merged. Because uh, I, I liked ATI graphics cards, but uh, then they merged and became AMD, and then I switched to Nvidia and Intel and became an Intel loyalist. So, anyways, there's an entire different set of computers and the general computers that we're talking about that have these different pieces, right? there is what are known as embedded systems. So that's the next thing that I kind of want to talk about. And, and that's going to actually kind of include, um, um, technically smartphones are going to be included, I believe under embedded systems. Um, yeah, yeah, technically cell phones and smartphones. Cause I mean, smartphones are kind of iffy nowadays because like they can do as much as a normal computer can do, but in theory, they are considered embedded systems. So what is an embedded system? Um, an embedded system is going to be, rather than a general purpose computer, like a laptop or a desktop, an embedded system refers to the use of electronics within a product. So it's more of converting something that wasn't necessarily a computer into having a computing power into it. And because in theory, phones were originally meant to make phone calls, they're embedded because now they have these smart capabilities and they became smart phones. Yes, that has changed nowadays. I'd say now, nowadays, a smart phone is more about the computing side than it is about the calling side. Like a lot of people get smartphones and they probably never even use it as a phone. They just have the computer side of things and that's okay uh, so you know these definitions are very flexible but uh, the biggest thing with embedded systems when, when they came out um, yeah I don't know but Threadripper sounds like a scam um, the biggest thing with with the embedded systems versus general computing is they're typically used for something that requires real-time computation now what does that mean real-time that means that if you have a device that is supposed to react and be smart per se, have some sort of AI quote unquote, because just a bunch of new statements, I suppose. 
It, it just has a, a, a way to, to, to react. It needs to happen in real time. In a normal computer, you know, if you're, if you're computing, you know, what you should do in a situation and it takes an hour to compute it, that's okay. But what we're talking about is that with an embedded system, you want responses to be immediate because you're using it in something that is critical. Like, for example, imagine the auto, uh, the braking system in your car. If you have like smart braking that is supposed to do collision de detection or avoidance kind of situation. You don't want it to start processing distance to the next car. And then five minutes from now, it's like, oh, yeah, you got a break. Yeah, in five minutes, you're already at the ER, you know. So, like, hopefully you are. But if not, then at least you crashed. So you um, you need these things to happen in real time. And embedded systems is probably going to be the most amount of computing devices that we have. They they overlap or overshadow or what? No, what's the right term? They the amount of them that you have is insanely big compared to the amount of general computing computers that you have. Back in the day, you have more normal computers, less embedded systems. Now it's completely the opposite. You can just see with the idea of smartphones. There's a higher chance of somebody having a smartphone than a laptop at home. And if they have a laptop, they probably have a smartphone, whereas they might have a smartphone but not a laptop. And so they're everywhere. And there's different uh, there's different sort of tiers of or generations of, of these embedded systems in what is now known as the Internet of Things or the IoT. Not to be confused with IOTA, the blockchain. So essentially the uh the constraints that you can have with these devices are going to be uh an assessment right there basically they need to be running in real time which means that they they need to react at the time that necessary and they have to be precise potentially there's time durations involved and um there 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 might have to do more than one activity although typically most of these embedded devices perform one big activity and then other supporting activities that support that one general activity. What are examples of these embedded devices? Well, yes, we have things like uh, smartphones, but if you, if you look on page 26, they actually show you sort of the evolution of them. Uh, so first we, we started out with some, you know, with, with basic big devices like routers and uh, servers Potentially, I, I, ser yeah, yeah, I guess servers could apply, but that's kind of iffy. But uh, routers for sure, and, and and those kind of devices. From there, we went into things like medical machinery, kiosks, you know, like an ATM potentially, and other oh, those kind of machines. Uh, then we went into sort of the consumer side of things with the third generation, and that's when smartphones came out and tablets, and then. Finally, kind of culminating into the fourth generation, which is what you guys are talking about, which is like a smart dishwasher, a smart fridge, probably a smart toilet. I wouldn't be surprised. Like it flush. I mean, hey, all you got to do is put a little motion sensor. When it moves, it flushes. Actually, they have those. Yeah, those are in the public bathroom. They have the smart toilet. So, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, yeah, they do. Think about it. The smart toilet. Like, like when you go to the bathroom, um, there's a little sensor. So when you leave the bathroom, it automatically flushes for you. That way people don't have to flush. That is technically a smart toilet, okay? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, yes, it would be nice if it also... Well, no, I don't know if it... Actually, preheating could be a good thing if it, like, superheats the toilet and just burns all bacteria. And then the, that way the next person sits is, like, clean. And also evaporates any uh, residue that may be on the toilet seat that actually would be pretty smart except unless they it glitches out and superheats it while you're sitting in it though that would be a smart problem uh, so a small problem <laughs> well actually a smart problem too i suppose but uh yeah so iot has really expanded into covering basically the uh the most devices possible does it say it here um yeah it says here Fortunately, marked by the use of billions of embedded items. We have way, 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 way more things. And now, why, what is the, the main reason between having smart devices? The main, the main purpose is for them to get information, potentially process that information, or prepare it, at least, and then send it over, over the internet, basically, to, to uh, another location, either the cloud or a computer and whatnot, which can then be processed. The idea of, of throwing computers at just about everything is, uh, is to be able to, to have more communication with these devices in, in how they're performing and to be able to monitor them better. So 
it's a big, big side of computing, but you can't really put in a, maybe in the fridge you could because it's big enough, but if you, have a, if you have a security camera, you can't throw in like a Von Neumann diagram computer at a security camera. That's not really gonna work out. Like you're gonna have to put little RAM sticks in there and then you get your CPU and then, um, you know, you, you little, your little, uh, your, 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 your cooling and potentially your, your little uh, power supply, a little hard drive in there. No, you can't do this. You can't do any of this stuff. So um, essentially, what you what what you have to do is you have to redesign how you're creating these computers, and so that's kind of the question on how you achieve that. There's also another little uh, diagram of possible that I kind of show you. Yeah, this one. You know what kind of stuff do you need in an embedded system? Okay, you have a processor. And you typically have an AD, which stands for analog and digital, which is something that I actually noticed that I was reading the book. It never ever mentions what AMD stands for, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure it means analog, analog to digital. And so you need to convert something that is in the real world. We don't, we don't, we don't get like zeros and ones thrown at us. You know, that's not how the world works. We get information potentially in a analog version of that, like radio. You know, and then we gotta convert that into zeros and ones that a computer understands. So that's what the A and D conversion happens, and that goes both directions. Because if your if our embedded system is supposed to output stuff like voice, for example, you know, little smart Google smart home device like Google Hub or whatever or Alexa, then uh, that's digital to analog conversion, converting zeros and ones into audio. And so we have embedded devices whose sole device or sole purpose is to do that. And then uh, the sensors are going to be your input and potentially your output could be a speaker or kind of actuator or indicator. Sometimes we want to have an ability to diagnose a problem with it. And that's because not a lot of the times, in fact, this is the least of our uh, focuses on embedded system is a human interface. Most embedded devices, at least in the fourth generation stuff, do not require human interface and do not have one. If you want to uh, work with it, you you know, if it works, or you throw it away and buy another one. There's no way to go in and figure things out. However, sometimes it's nice to have a diagnosis port for that human interface, if it has it. Um, sometimes we also want to be able to upgrade it, to have like a firmware upgrade and to add functionality. So what ends up happening is a lot of these embedded devices don't require to have uh, storage. At like like a, like a, like a, like a hard drive kind of storage or 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 SS or like a USB sort of NAND drive storage. What they do is they actually have hard coded into part of the memory. They burn into their instructions of the programs that it needs to run. Because those are the only programs that it needs to run. So it doesn't need to have like f flexible parts of memory. It's just it's just burned in, and that's going to be in what they consider the memory gear. Now it may also have some uh, some some memory that can change for the ongoing operations, but it doesn't need to have a hard drive that you can write and read to. Although it might be good to allocate a little bit of this if, if we want to be able to update it, like firmware updated. But if we don't, then, you know, we can just hard code every single instruction into the, into the, uh, into the device with custom logic as I show here. So how would you describe when cars turn on household appliances? Like they show the car commercials. Are those embedded systems? Yeah, pretty much everything in your car is embedded. Pretty much everything that is not a computer, as in a laptop or a desktop, is going to be considered an embedded system. Like practically, just, outside of maybe like a supercomputer or those kind of servers. Like I think a server is iffy. I think a server is really just a computer because they have the same architectures even. So I disagree with them. They called it an embedded system a server, maybe back in the day. But even 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 a Raspberry Pi, I think, is actually considered an embedded system, even though it's kind of more of a computer than anything else. But I think even that would be considered an embedded system. So yeah, they're all embedded systems. In fact, they even talk about here about car, car examples and things like that. And so, yeah, various automotive systems, transmission control, cruise control, fuel injection, anti-lock brakes, and suspension systems, toothbrushes. <laughs> I like how they go from cars to toothbrushes. I mean, we all need our toothbrushes, right? And so, uh, I'll skip the applicated stuff. Microprocessors with microcontrollers. That's a good one to talk about. 
So application versus dedicated processors, you can you can you can read that on your own. Here's an example of a microprocessor and what kind of things it has. Okay, so this is this is good. I should have put this one up earlier. So uh, we got our analog to digital. Uh, oh, here's the word analog. So at least they they tell you one of those things. So um, from here, look at this EEPROM. Okay, and ROM. These two are usually going to contain permanent stuff. That is going to be your uh, your your program instructions potentially, and any data that you always require. Like if 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 you're uh... yeah, it does have tennis racket in there. Well, I mean nowadays you can do that because you put like a smartwatch on and, and and you swing the racket, you can detect the motion of the racket. So yeah, but uh, yeah. Basically, your ROM and e ROM is going to probably be program data that is always there, so it's hard, it just burn into there permanently. And then also data that might, you might require to have permanently. What kind of data would you always need? Well, if your device is supposed to always output some sounds, you might want to burn into there the pattern of frequencies that you're supposed to feed it. Uh, from there, they talk about deeply embedded systems, and I, that's kind of a weird thing that they're talking about, and even they say they try to Google and try to find a definition, but they couldn't find one. Um, I think the definition they came up with was the idea that a deeply embedded system has just one task and nothing else, and it's difficult to be observed. Um, so I suppose they're the most of simplest things possible, like it just does one thing, so we'll kind of not worry about what that is but other than has no interaction with the user that could be a, a a good sort of definition of what that is but anyways moving on to something more important arm why arm because of all possible uh quote unquote embedded systems this is the one that kind of should be its own thing so let's talk about the arm architecture so first of all what does arm stand for arm stands for the company that created it which is called acorn risk machine Oh, that's also here down here, Acorn Risk Machine. And as it says here, it is the most widely used embedded processor architecture, okay? But I would say this is just its own category at this point. Like, it should really just be this thing. Um, risk, oh, by the way, risk versus CISC. So this ARM is risk. What does risk stand for? Reduced instruction, reduced instruction uh, sequence. Set computer, yeah. Reduced instruction set computer. And this is in comparison to like x86 and general purpose computing, that is complex instruction set computers. Now you learned this in 218 probably, but I will give you the, the quick and short summary of that from my, from my memory. Risk-based architectures uh, pride themselves in having a low number of instructions, as the name implies. And the idea of that is to really make those instructions sufficient and to Avoid having so much clutter of unnecessary things that you don't really use. Cisc, on the other hand, is like, yo, we got so much space and so much stuff that we're going to add in as many instructions as you want, and we're going to specialize them so that they can achieve things that uh, would otherwise be more complicated to do. And we can even, like, you know, focus on making a certain instruction really good to make it super fast. The cost of this is that they usually use more power and more instructions makes things more complicated so harder to code, but if you really want to take advantage of it, and uh, more expensive to make because you got more more complicated sort of transistor groupings, I suppose. I think you can now code an iPad with the iPad. You can always code on an iPad if you download like a terminal, and you can even SSH to, to, to Sally with it. Um, Yes, the architecture in general will be more complex with uh, with a CISC. So, RISC. RISC itself, um, not RISC, ARM itself is just a company. And what they do is they, they either license the architecture so that, so that other companies can make their own chips based on the RISC architecture, which you could think of it like a sort of a standard, which I think is what Apple and other companies do. But the other... Uh, thing that they do is they, um, um, here's Apple. I think they also, they partner themselves with a, uh, with a company to manufacture chips themselves. 
So they will partner with a company to manufacture ARM chips, but they will also just sell you the the instruction set and the the idea of how to do it, so you can make your own chips that follow the standard. Okay, so that's I, th I think those are the two things they do. They either partner with a company to uh, manufacture the chips, or they sell you the uh, the architecture so that you can make your own chips. So basically, they sell you the license to do that. And so that's what Apple will do: is Apple pays money to ARM, and then goes to Taiwan and makes Taiwan's factory, I forgot the name, to manufacture the ARM chips for Apple. So uh, TSM, that is, I think, is that the name of the company? Taiwan, uh, whatever it is. But yeah, it, it's definitely done in, in Taiwan by a factory. And it's the same factory that will do the ARM chips for like Qualcomm and other things, I think. So uh, yeah, is, is it that, I, that name? Does, does, the acronym you guys are posting does seem like it. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Yeah, you guys are right. So uh, yeah, they they you know don't don't discredit them. Don't think that because they're in Taiwan they're like bad or something. No, like amazing things are done in Taiwan actually. Probably like the best things. That's why all these companies are using them. So so they're pretty uh, they're pretty serious people. But uh, yeah, these guys are worth billions. Um, do they not have a list of the? I guess one of the things that people don't like to, to advertise is that they're using Taiwan to manufacture things. So they don't have an easily accessible list of the people they're working with, I guess, that I can't find. But they make chips for just about everybody. There's nothing wrong with Taiwan. But a lot of people talk crap about, like, oh, yeah, it's made in China or it's just made in Taiwan, so it must be bad. No, like, some of the best things in the world are made there. So, yeah. Uh, it's all about the quality control, frankly, you know. And um, yeah, so anyways, the rest of the, uh, the section here on the ARM, they talk about sort of the main categories of ARMs they have, at which they call ARM. Surprise, surprise, they're interesting they picked that name. And so essentially the, the three categories are, maybe they have a, yeah, are like this. The most popular being the M. I think that uh, M... Uh, M3, I think, is the most popular one. Actually, no. M is the uh, the uh, the low level ones. Yeah, M is extremely low gate count and lowest power consumption possible. Here's the other thing, RISC and and, and and this is why they use them for smartphones. RISC architecture and the ARM architecture, which is based on RISC, is um, super super low power consumption. Your normal computers are going to be drawing anywhere from 400 to like 800 uh, watts of power every you know for, to run per second arms are going to be drawing so much less than that what number shoot i don't actually know it, it's it's but it's like super low maybe like 20 watts 100 it's definitely less than 100 watts but uh, you can you can go ahead and, and google how much your your smartphones draw power and that's really the big thing because the most limiting factor with a, with a with a embedded device that is potentially running on the field is that it's running on battery. And you don't want it to just drain the battery so quickly. Cisc processors are always consuming electricity even when they're not doing operations. That's just part of the architecture of that. We'll talk about that. Risks you can basically save so much power when you're not running anything on it, and also they're just using very little power in general. Yes, yeah, we have. Oh, I, I don't even know if I want to mention that because it's all on YouTube. And like, otherwise, China will be like, no, you're not recognizing Taiwan. You can't play your YouTube video on China. So, uh, then there's a fancy Cortex M2 diagram you can look at. So, you can kind of see. Yeah, I might as well see one since that's kind of going to be the end of the chapter. It's uh, an example of a low power, low logic gates a, a system. And again, you still want to keep it real time, but for what the operation is doing, but if your operation requires very little computing power, then you don't need to give it more because A, it increases the cost and B, it uses more power like electricity, which would be bad. So as you can see here, this is very, very different than uh, your general purpose computing from Intel. You still have some of the basic things like you have memory, you have some RAM memory, 
Um, flash memory is going to be like your SSD-ish type of memory, which is slow. You get your RAM memory. Uh, some of them have some sort of debug interface, yes, I suppose. The memory protection unit you see here is the thing that protects you, again, from accidentally overwriting other programs' memory. Not all of the Cortex architectures have that, actually. They, uh, I think the A and R don't... Actually, no. The There's one of the three that doesn't have it. So, which one of those is? I'm not 100% sure on it. It's the... Um, the R. Yeah, the R does... No, the R does have it. R does have memory protection unit. Um, yeah. The M does not have memory protection unit. Does have it, but does not have MMU. MMU is the... Um, uh what is what is it memory management unit yes which is something that actually if you if you want to have a os you need to have a memory management unit so you um for example it says that the um the cortex r does not have MMU, so you can't use that for like an android phone the a series these are the ones that android phones are working on and, and other things like iPhones and stuff. Yes, the A series. So if anything, make sure you over read over the A series so you can see the kind of features that they have. Okay, it's just, it's just short. So, yep, that's that. We can basically skip over all of the different details of the ARM architecture. Um, read about the memory protection unit though, because that is actually important. But other than that, the other ones are, are unnecessary to know. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the end of the chapter one. Anybody have any questions? We went slow with chapter one because it's a lot of introductory stuff. Basically, we're covering a lot of the stuff that we're going to later talk in detail about. So might as well talk about it now. From then, chapter two, we are going to start learning a little bit about how to measure performance of a computer. Since we all care about knowing whether a computer is better than somebody else's. And, you know, if we're trying to sell stuff. Um, oh, here, I had a little list of, of reasons why uh, why you want embedded systems, you want to optimize them for. Cost, energy, code size, execution time, weight, and dimensions. So, yeah, but anyway, any questions? What's the most important from chapter one? Uh, that's hard because chapter one, again, covers just about everything we're going to cover. So, like, cash important because we will cover that later on um well you don't need to remember like all the different developments like oh yeah there's a chip out of this and that it's important for historically to respect the, the, the progress of all the different uh architectures and what they not actually but sorry uh chipsets and what they added in um i suppose it's important even though most of you know already to know what a transistor is because that's like the heart of the computer so i would i would definitely uh know that but like i said i think that will become more relevant as we go over other parts what reading should we do tonight did you find out how you can upload the slides i have not um i will i will check because like there's this thing at the end here that says uh this work is protected by united states copyright law and it's only for use instructor in teaching their courses dissemination or sale of any part of this work will destroy the integrity of the work and is not permitted. Uh, the work material from it should never be made available to it should never be made available to students except by instructors using the accompanying text in their classes. See, so I don't know what I can interpret from that. Um, it should never be made available to students except by instructors using the accompanying text in their classes. What is my interpretation of that? Does that mean that I can make it available because we are using the book and you all paid for the book anyways? Um, so what I can do is I think, okay, if, if we go with that, then I guess the, the, the legality of that is that I can upload it to Canvas, but you can't share it with anybody outside of the class, I suppose. So that seems to be kind of the thing because that's like everywhere like it's literally stamped everywhere so i don't want to i don't want to go to jail for, for for pearson or whatever so okay if that's the case i'll try to go ahead and then there's also the figure one i don't think the figure one you need me to upload because that's just literally the same pictures in the book just some of them are nice because they're in color like this is in color and it looks so much better than the book one but it's just the pictures from the book 
and some of them are, the, are already in the PowerPoint. So I don't think this one I need to really upload. There's no purpose for that. That one doesn't even have a copyright in it, though. So I know this one for sure I could upload. But, uh, yeah. So the readings that I want you to do for, um, for tomorrow are going to be... I, I mean, in theory, you should. I told you to kind of read ahead into 2.1. No, no, I, we might kind of talk about it for the last few minutes about that. But I want you to read for tomorrow 2.3. Read 2.3 and 2.4. 2.2 you don't really need to read, uh, although it's like literally a page long. Um, so you can read it if you want, but I don't think we're going to talk about it at all. And if I do talk about it, in fact, why don't we talk about it now? Um, it actually introduces GPUs, so... You know, I think we all know what a GPU is, but if you don't, you should uh, you should read that. You should read that one page. But for tomorrow, what I do want you to read is I want you to read 2.3 and then 2.4. How big is? Let me see if I can get because I do. I would I would actually would like you to read all the way to 2.5. Let me see how much it is to read. So we got 2.4. Yeah, okay, we can definitely do this. Okay, this is definitely doable. So read 2.3 to 2.5 for tomorrow because that way the TA can go over examples of Amdahl's law, uh, Little's law. Those are just math equations that you want to figure out how to use. And then he can also go over clock speed, actually. And I'll go over it as well, but he can actually go over how to mesh, compute clock speed. And then um, he can go over these means, which are just different kinds of means. So that basically, he can go over a bunch of math with you and do examples of it. And that is going to be his purpose. He doesn't necessarily have to explain too much about what Amdahl's Law does, but I want you to know how to compute it. So that when we can talk about it on Monday, then you guys can feel more familiarized with it. Uh, and then I might assign you a little bit more reading over the weekend so that we can go a little bit faster. Um, on Monday, so check Canvas tomorrow. I'm gonna wait to see what the TA actually does end up covering. Because I mean, if he, if you guys are already stuck with like Amdahl's law and that's all you cover in the day, that's okay. But then that's going to modify how, how you know how much I expect you to do because we gotta catch up. So uh, check on Canvas for after your class and after I talk to the TA. So check like maybe like Friday afternoon what your reading will be for Monday. And that reading will show up under week two because it'll show up for Monday, okay? So don't get confused. Remember the day next to the reading is when it's due, okay? So uh, that's that's basically your your task. So I, what I said now is the same thing I'll put on Canvas. I'll go and update it. But I do think I already had it ready to go. The one that you don't really need to read is the uh, 2.1 because that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. Let's see, what can we mention about that? Uh, it's really just kind of introducing some of the concepts like pipelining and branch prediction. So we can kind of, we can talk a little bit about that actually. So let me go ahead and open up the slides from that because I'd rather start talking about it than not because, you know, it's summer and time is tight. So we don't want to just like give away 10 minutes of class time when we can actually uh, use it. 10 minutes of class time. So, designing for performance, which should really say designing so we can get more money because ultimately performance kind of directly relates to getting more money. You know, think about this AMD Intel thing, whichever one was the fastest one, people would want to buy that. You know, it's a, it's a race. Is reading the only homework we're gonna have this weekend? Yes, for now, that will be the only homework you have this weekend just to read. Um, unless the TA decides to assign you some problem or something, but I highly doubt it. Um, this is a very, very, very important understatement that a laptop, and I think, I think we can actually replace the word laptop there with smartphone nowadays, but today's smartphones have the computing power that an IBM mainframe, that means like, think of like a, a quote unquote supercomputer, like a mini supercomputer had. 10 to 15 years ago, okay? In fact, you're, if you have a nice GPU, like if a 1080 Ti or something, that amount of floating point calculations would rival a supercomputer from a couple of years ago. 
And so that kind of is cool to hear, but at the same time, when you read the next bullet point here, kind of makes me sad that it's so inexpensive to uh, to basically to make these computers that usually when you upgrade your CPU, when you upgrade your build, you just throw away the old parts. You don't, I mean, heck, you might recycle at least. And I hope you do, but by recycling, it probably just becomes a can of like Coca-Cola or something. You know, it doesn't become another processor because it's so cheap. And so that's that's just how how insane of the technology advancement we're doing, where things are just going up dramatically in both price and going going up in in, this, in performance and going down in price. And that's that's really cool, you know. So, you know, when I say performance, the, what what we really, really want to figure out is how do we actually measure the performance? Like, how do we measure how something is uh, essentially uh, fast or slow, right? How do we compare? And so, one of the ways that we can compare is going to be based on how fast it can perform computations. So then we can be like, okay, we can feed it a program, we can time it, you know? We could also go ahead and look at physical uh, features of it. Like, does it have more, more multiple cores? Does it have, um, what is the clock cycle of it? You know, how much RAM does it have? These are all potential performance measurements, but some of them can be flawed because if you say, okay, the more transitions, the better, it's not enough because it might be possible that you're having multiple cores. And having multiple cores, you know, doesn't automatically make something faster. Because the big advantage when we, when we were initially growing computers was that we were putting more transitions in the same chip, which means that you could do more computations sequentially. But when we had problems with that and we introduced the idea of a multi-core system, now you have two cores that can be doing things in parallel. But as you will find out with Amdahl's law, you can't just, so say, say, say something takes 10 seconds to do, okay? You have 10 seconds to run, uh, it takes 10 seconds to run this program to compute, um, um, I don't know, your taxes, okay? So what do you do? You upgrade and you buy a better, a faster computer. Now, if this computer is sequential, it takes maybe five seconds now, then it, you know, because it's twice the number of transistors, but it's, it's one core still, one processing unit with one core, yes, okay, sure, it'll have the, it'll literally half the time it takes, but that's that's it, that's the end of it. You know, twice the power, you know, basically half the time. Okay, that works if it's sequential. But now if the computer that you buy is multi-core and it has twice the number of transistors, but they're split into two cores, it's not as easy as just halving the time. Because with parallel code, what ends up happening is the following. Let me let me go over to uh, to, the, to the iPad. When you're running something sequentially, I'm saying that you're running it in, in you know one direction. You process things on it, and then eventually you're done with it. With parallel, we have two processing units, so you have to split the workload between them, and then you gotta combine it back together. Okay. So you're like, okay, I'm splitting my workload into two computers. I should be able to just half the time it takes, just like with my se sequential. That's not the case because not the entire program probably can be parallelized. And even if it could, even if the majority of it could be parallelized, you still need to spend some time combining it back together here and also figuring out who takes what part there. So you can only parallelize parts of programs. And when you do, you run into other potential issues. Like, what can you even parallelize? If these two things are supposed to share data, you know, we get into the errors that I was talking about, uh, I think yesterday with race condition and, and having to use something like a mutex, like a semaphore. You know, that all takes time and slows you down. So it's not as easy as just saying, okay, one solution to being able to have more computing power is just to have more computers, basically, which is what each core will do. It's just, I mean, your own little computer having a bunch of them or having a secret computer that is made up of multiple nodes, each node being an entire uh, computer. That is not just going to half it automatically. Amdahl's law will talk about how do you really compute, 
how much throwing more computing power at this thing in a parallel fashion is going to actually speed things up. And you're going to see that sort of uh, change of how you're going to reach a limit where adding more computers is not going to make things faster because when you maximize the amount that can be parallelized, that's kind of limits you on how much you can do. So like if you have 10 instructions that can be done in parallel, okay, you could feed, you could have 10 computers that each one does one instruction and then you got to merge them all together. And assuming that the merging didn't really take that long, you know, and the, and the, the splitting didn't take that long, you're still not going to gain more by throwing in an 11th computer because what is that computer going to do? You only have 10. You can't have each computer do half an instruction. That doesn't really work out that way. So you are limited in what you can do. And it's a big problem actually because parallelizing programs is a very complicated task and you can't just throw a sequential program into a computer that has parallel, uh, you know, multi-core and just expect it to be faster. You actually have to modify how the program works and that's a very, very complicated thing to do for some algorithms and some programs. And so what it ends up being in the real world is we have these computers, most of us, that have more than one core and there's tons of programs that don't even take advantage of that. And so you might be like, oh, I have this amazing computer that has, you know, i9, that has eight or 10 cores or whatever it has. And then um, you're running a program that is running Unity, like a game that's only using one core. And somebody who has a three-year-old computer might have a single core that's a little bit faster than yours, but it's just one core. So this computer in general is just old and slower, but because a single core is a little bit faster than yours, his performance is better in the game than yours, even though his rig is like two years old. And you're like, why? That's why. So that's kind of what the TA will be talking about with you tomorrow and showing you how to compute this actually. Because again, with performance, we want to have numbers that we can put next to our product, just like Intel did on that website, so that you can look at that and then you can look at Ryzen and you can be like, I'm gonna be a fanboy for this company or that company. Yes, essentially yes. Yeah, so just because you can have more cores doesn't mean that the instruction can be run faster, especially if the process is dependent on the course results. Well, yes, that, yes, if it's dependent on other results, you know, if, if, you know, suppose what ends up happening is you might have a piece of the program that can be parallel, then a part that's sequential, and then a part that's parallel again, okay? So the problem is you can't go on further from here until all of the cores are finished. So if you have like a lazy core, I think that's one of the names they call it, you know, this core could be done, but then this one's still working, you know, and until this one finishes, the program is just sitting there waiting. And then finally, when everybody's done, then again, they can go to the next part, split it up. And the same thing can happen here. If one core takes longer than the other ones, he's going to slow everybody down. So that, uh, that's another part of the program. How do you balance the workload between different cores? That's also very complicated to do because it might not just be as easy as splitting the data like half and half because some data may be more heavy to compute than the other one. So you're never going to have that perfect split. So yes, like a group project where the one person doesn't do anything. Yeah. And by the way, even though you don't get homework tonight, one of the things that I was thinking of to do as a homework assignment for programming that you might get like in the middle of next week is uh, once we learn more is if you go back to chapter one, this thing, uh, let me uh, switch over to the PowerPoint. This is what I kind of want I want you guys to eventually, I, I, I'm thinking we can do in C++. I'm going to try to do it first and then see what kind of, it takes to do but we, sh we should be able to build a little toy simulation of the IIS computer and in general your general purpose computing so we can make a little array or vector that is our RAM and then we can make the registers be like variables and then um, the little core is just gonna be like a computer calculator or something and then um, once we start talking about pipelining and, and different systems of caching and, and virtual addressing, we can add it to our little simulation. So this can be sort of like the little project that we're going to be working on. So I think this is what we'll be doing with C++. Uh, I was thinking about it. I just want to code it myself first to see how ambitious of a project that would be to make this little pseudo simulator of a, of a, of a computer organization because that's kind of the name of the class. So uh, yeah, that will be coming up but it won't I won't make it you guys started this weekend because I actually want to do it first to make sure that it's not too much to uh, that we can handle you know it shouldn't be it should be kind of easy but 
I don't know. That's things look easy before you start coding them, and then you start coding them, and you're like, oh snap! I didn't think about this thing. That's gonna take two hours to do. So, yeah. So, uh, yep, that is gonna be the plan. So make sure you guys attend tomorrow, and uh, make sure you ask the TA lots of questions and that you understand what the TA is talking about. Uh, we will go over some of the theory on Monday, but uh, you know. Take advantage of, of having the TA there as well to ask him questions about what we talked about this week as well. You know, the TA is well aware of what's happening. All right. So, uh, yeah, that kind of concludes the first week of real material. So, you know, we only did one chapter, but it's an important chapter because it's kind of the overview of how a computer works. And that's important to all to understand. So it's worth spending that time on this. So, uh, yeah. Since I won't see you guys, I mean, I, I might show up tomorrow just to see how the TA is going, but maybe, maybe not. I don't really want to kind of interject myself there. I want to have the TA do its own thing. So, so uh, yeah, we did. We did go over 1.7. That was ARM. That was all the ARM stuff, essentially. The A, R, and M processors and how memory protection unit... We didn't go over the, the part that we I didn't like we didn't go over all of the different names that they have for pieces, but because that's that's too detailed for our purposes. But yes, we did. So yes. Oh no, we don't have cloud I don't have cloud computing on on this. I guess they got rid of that on the eleventh edition. There is no uh there is no section on cloud computing. It ends on ARM architecture. Yeah, there's nothing on cloud computing on my book in my book. Like literally 1.7 is called ARM architecture. 1.6 is called embedded systems. 1.5 is the evolution of the Intel architecture, which was all the chips we went over. And uh, 1.4 is transistors. So, I don't know. At least you learn about cloud computing. Yay. <laughs> I don't know. Just make sure that you actually had a section on ARM, on, on ARM as well. Okay? So, uh, cool. Since I won't see you guys until Monday, have a good weekend. But... Do attend tomorrow, all right? And uh, I'll be on Discord if you guys have any questions about anything tomorrow too. So, cool. Keep monitoring Canvas so that I can update the readings over the weekend based on what the TA covers tomorrow. Okay? So check that out on the evening tomorrow. All right, guys. I'll see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend.